What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast brought to you by Keeping Carlson and hosted by two guys who love Jakob Vrana, but only one uh, who was so bold as to pick him up before his double scratch. I'm Louis Ezekiel, and joining me tonight, my pal and yours, Shams Benamore. Shams, how you doing on this fine Thursday evening? Uh, the sad thing is, is that uh, you could say two people that picked him up because you may have picked him up in uh, a couple, but I was the uh, none the wiser and ended up getting him in Papapful. So both of us are Verona holders happily at this moment. Oh, no. Luckily, I, I managed to dodge that particular oh, okay. uh, hand grenade. I, I have been a Verona owner in uh, both leagues uh, in the not so you know distant past. Well, the, the age on you know, time of the beginning of the season, but uh, since uh, jettisoned uh, quite a while ago. I had the um, taste anyway. of having, uh, <laughs> I had the taste of actually having a red wing that I could roster was a little bit too much. So I had to take the chance and uh, I wasn't rewarded. <laughs> yeah, I have, I've had Lucas Raymond and I had Kubalik to start the season um, or early in the season too, which was very nice. And yes, we are both Red Wings fans. So it is always nice to have a roster worthy Red Wings to play with. Um, Kubalik, of course, his, uh, his, the shine has come off very much. Uh, it was just, um, who was it? It was uh, Slim Cliffy uh, was talking about how um, basically uh, Dylan Larkin scores twice as much when. Um, when Lucas Raymond is on the bench. So uh, the Wowie chart for Raymond is unfortunately very grim. So, you know, we're not, we're not holding the Red Wings uh, that, that really are, are worthwhile, uh, unfortunately. Um, I guess that takes us right into our first topic. So obviously Verona was scratched on Wednesday uh, after getting the call up, scratched again here tonight, uh, which is Thursday night. Uh, so what's the deal? Like, why make it so that he is able to come up? Why? What's what's the whole song and dance routine about? Are they trying to get? Are they going to get him into the lineup to try and showcase him for a trade? Like everyone sort of feels like he's hit his last, yeah, potentially played his last game as a Red Wing. That would mean not showing him off for a trade. Like, do you have any sense of what's going on here? Honestly, I like looking back now. I have some guesses, but honestly, I think it was more of uh, like. Raymond got hurt, so they had a roster spot open. So my guess is they just brought him up and then maybe they would have him there. Because, like, in the end, would you say, okay, he's going to get the start because he got another AHL goal? Like, he got so many points. Show Like, we all know he's not an AHL player because he's just better than that. So there's nothing really to gain from there. So they must have just brought him up. And oddly enough, we choke up at the Red Wings and having Ross Bowl players. They might not have many fantasy players, but they have a lot of like NHL caliber, like okay people. So they're not like a year or two ago when it would just be like, hey, we just need anyone that had some semblance of ability. So it's actually now they have to make a reason for Verona to be on the ice. I think both of us are the mind that that should be an easy case. But I think the coaches are saying, hey, our forwards are doing well enough that maybe until one of them goes into the doghouse, we don't see him. Yeah, Elon made the point in our group chat that given that they beat Edmonton and had, you know, a really uh, pretty impressive showing, I would say, uh, yeah, why make the change, right? So, yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, tough. I I would say, you know, he's going to get into a game just for fun, you know, (laughs) after... um, uh, after people have begun to drop him again, probably, but it's just not worth my time, my effort. I think, uh, I think they want to show that he is healthy and could play if, if called upon. Um, you know, just sort of like, hey, you're not, you're not buying a total lemon if you trade for this guy. But yeah, I think he is, he is all but done, uh, as a Red Wing, which, which is too bad because, you know, we always get very excited about him as a, you know, low usage, but high production player. Um, but you know, I, I, I feel like the change of scenery, sometimes we get overhyped about it when the reality is there's a reason that this player ends up in the doghouse. Obviously he spent some time, um, you know, in, uh, in the, the program <laughs> and, you know, uh, hopefully he's got his life together in a way that he's going to be able to continue as a professional. Cause obviously he's got a ton of skill, but yeah, I, I just, you know, it's, I hope that it would happen in Detroit, but if it's not going to happen in Detroit, let's move on to the next chapter here. I think, uh, about as quick as we can. I wonder too, uh, if maybe the result is, uh, or, or this might be a reason why we don't end up seeing, um, 
Uh, you know, there's all that talk about a Tyler Bertuzzi trade potentially. I wonder if this Verana stuff maybe cools that idea a little bit. Just pure speculation on my part. Oh, yeah. It's just really weird now, like with them as a team, because we've just been so used to them being, you know, bottom dwellers with no hope to do anything and just like selling any piece that's not young. But if I remember correctly, they're like, obviously the East is going to be hard to get in, but like, it's not like 100% out of the question that like they could make it into the playoffs. They probably get smoked, but there's still like the possibility of the playoffs are around. Like maybe they just don't sell and be like, Hey, we want to have like meaningful games at the end of the year and then try to get like that kind of thing. And then maybe they sneak in. Like, I'm not even sure if, like what's going to happen or they could literally just sell them all off because you know, the hardest thing to do in the world is guess what Iserman is thinking. So I'm just going to see it when it happens and then we can talk about it then. <laughs> All right. Well, we had a number of other kind of interesting uh, injury-related items, both injuries and outtries, um, or delayed outtries, basically. Uh, we did have Austin Matthews make his big return, uh, much to the relief of Matthews' managers who had been just trying to get by in the meantime. Uh, Matthews uh, had a goal and an assist in his return, so very nice for him. Obviously, uh, you know, the the Leafs had Nylander and uh, Tavares and uh, Marner to hold down the fort while he was gone. So, uh, and of course they had what, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest lines in NHL history. Uh, you know, <laughs> you weren't going to make very much betting on Toronto to beat the Blackhawks last night and beat them. They did. Uh, so a nice, uh, a nice opportunity for Matthews coming back. Um, another guy who we've been having a little bit of whiplash with kind of in Verona style is Jake DeBrusque. If you remember, Jim Montgomery said he would be shocked if. DeBrus did not come back uh, the first game out of the All-Star break. Uh, what's the latest on JDB? It's another game and another game that he's not playing tonight. So at this moment, I don't believe there's anything said by the coach. I think it was more of a beat writer saying there's a chance that he could play this weekend. So I would even put an expectation. I feel like right now it's just have him on your IR plus pretend that he's not there and then you might find a treat <laughs> if he starts playing. But at this point, I'm not sure if he re-aggravated something. We all know how the NHL is with actually told us injuries. So it could be perfectly fine or something happened, but all we know he's not playing. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't actually thought about, you know, maybe it's just something else going on, a tweak or whatever. Um, yeah. And of course, if he does come back on Saturday, Saturday is by far our busiest day of the week. Uh, not, you know, you would, I would imagine that managers would be able to find room to bring him in potentially as long as he is back in his old deployment. Uh, so he's probably an upgrade over someone on your roster, but it probably does mean that you are benching someone, uh, decent, uh, to get that game in. So, uh, I don't know. I, depending on how things work out, especially because I kind of want to drop a defenseman to get him, but I'm not full on, uh, the blue line on Saturday. I might actually wait a game. We'll see. That might, that might come back to bite me. I hate when that happens. Um, so yeah, we're still waiting for Jake DeBrus to come back. Um, but Rasmus Anderson, uh, returns for the Flames. He is playing. I, that game must have just gotten underway, uh, with Detroit out in Calgary. Um, you know, we'll certainly touch on the goalie situation in Calgary a little bit later on. Um, but Anderson coming back, I think, is, uh, obviously good news. Um, you know, t- take some, uh, the shine off of Wegar if you had him. Uh, and also, uh, I assume returns, uh, Gilbert, uh, to, you know, uh, off the lineup. So he did have a nice little run, but I doubt many people picked him up for fantasy. What I'm kind of interested in, you know, uh, I thought he was an interesting potential pickup because he was going pretty cheap, uh, at the draft table. And he, you know, was, was potentially going to be, he obviously is holding down that power play one slot. Like that finally is formalized what we didn't maybe expect was for Calgary to struggle as much as they have on the power play, uh, especially with Huberdo not really kind of being the guy that they hoped. And, and Toffoli is picking up some of that slack as we were talking about before the show started. But um, I'm curious to think where would you rate uh, Rasmus Anderson for next season? Right now he's 27th overall uh, among defensemen in fantasy points per game in the cupful. He's tied with Jacob Truba. Uh, some names that he is just ahead of include people like Darnell Nurse, Philip Ronick, Tony D'Angelo, uh, Tori Krug. 
Um, and just behind, uh, like Shea Theodore, Mo Sider, uh, Aaron Ekblad. So, you know, some pretty decent company. Do you think that he, you know, because the, Flames have underperformed a little bit here in the first year of Huberto's contract. Do you think he can get more comfortable and maybe you get a steal uh, at the draft table? Or should we maybe, um, you know, not? I think this season he maybe got a little bit of an artificial bump because of what people imagined Calgary's offense might be like. Uh, would be would we potentially be at risk of overpaying for him next year if we get that mindset? The way I look at it is that he's kind of in that, a zone that I'm not a fan of in the draft table for um, defensemen. Like I'm not a big fan of just drafting defensemen in general because you get a lot of these questions where, like, he ends up being in a position where he might be perfectly fine, but like we're gonna have to see if stuff can change in Calgary because right now we can tell that it's not working. There might be some drastic changes, or honestly, I'm not sure if. What could happen to have uh, the coach leave? He's basically like the king there. So he's probably going to be back. And they spent so much in that, like the front line that I'm not sure anything can really change. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think maybe he might be still an interesting pick next season. I think if Uberdo can kind of get things sorted out and feel a little more comfortable next year, um, you know, it could be a potential a nice opportunity. He has been hampered by injury a couple times this season, and I wonder if any of that has nagged at him. But you're you're talking me down a little bit, at least from getting you know overhyped about him. I don't wanna I don't wanna go too far in terms of you know getting excited about getting a deal that it ends up not being a deal. That's the big danger, of course, when you think that you're getting a sleeper. Is he's only a sleeper if you pay a sleeper's price. Uh, so that's something that I'll be keeping an eye on, but, uh, yeah, you've made a good point. I think I am, uh, I think I'm gonna, uh, ease off on him just a little bit. Um, a couple other injury news items before we head into a short break. Uh, Cam Talbot is coming back to skate with the team on Friday and Saturday. Uh, that certainly makes it sound like he's not going to be back and ready to go at that time, but, uh, he is making its way back. Um, how do we feel about the effect on Sogard? I think he, you know, he had a nice outing, um, you know, likely to get, uh, probably those Friday, Sunday starts, uh, but going to be short lived. You would have to imagine with Talbot likely to return soon, right? Yeah. And, uh, basically, uh, it's just going to be in a situation where, well, we know how Talbot is. It's, uh, could have another DeBrusque on our hands of like, oh yeah, he's coming back. So like, I don't want to guarantee anything, but like, I was hesitant to pick up him in or um, either of the new sense goalies just because I wasn't sure about how they'd play. So I don't have the shot, but like, I feel like if they're available, hey, it's a stream anyway, and you might get a second one. Like, that's the way I look at it. But like, just be ready to drop them when like Talbot's back. But like. Maybe just like wait a bit to see that he's actually like starting because he does have that history. But yeah, don't be counting on them to take you through the playoffs right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I did pick up Sogard, so I'm going to ride him as long as Talbot is out because it seems like he had a nice start. And of course, Ottawa is usually pretty good to uh, allow a nice number of shots so that even if he does get scored on a few times, uh, usually it means you're still going to get a nice score. So Last guy we want to talk about, uh, Gabe Velarde, expected back this weekend. Another potential uh, Sunday return. Um, that was a guy that I grabbed while injured in Babupful uh, last week once the, the outcome was obvious because uh, I could move him right onto IR and make another grab. Um, I like the idea of getting Velarde back. You know, uh, Jared Anderson Dolan has been doing okay on that third line, but... Uh, it really, you know, when it's Lizat and Fiala, obviously Fiala especially, uh, and Velarde, that can be an interesting spot. And uh, with luck, we'll see Velarde resume his position on the top power play for the Kings. Um, so, you know, that's a guy who did hit the waiver wire in a lot of places. He was injured for quite a while at a time when there have been an awful lot of injuries. So if he's kicking around, that's a guy that I would probably take a look at. Um, I think I would like him even more than a guy we're going to talk about on the other side of the break. Um, but I'm going to go ahead, Shams, if you've got something you want to share on Velarde, uh, let's do that before we, we get too far ahead of ourselves. I'm in the, the same boat as you, is that I'm not sure if he's available in any of my leagues, but he was showing flashes, and especially in uh, the last little bit, uh, the Kings can show that they've been uh, 
easy to get some goals on their side. So uh, even if it's him not scoring, maybe he's getting assists because everyone seems to be hot at the moment. So no issue with uh, taking a shot on him. Yeah. And, you know, rather than going into a break here, we might as well bring up the next guy, too. Uh, And that was that Matt Boldy uh, was moved up to the top line in the Wilds game on Wednesday, uh, playing between Kaprizov and Zuccarello. Uh, so we only got those five even strength minutes with line one, but in that time they managed seven shot attempts for and three against, and they had a goal, although uh, Boldy did not factor into the scoring. Uh, he did register a power play assist on that top unit. Uh, I guess my question then is, do we think that Boldy means, you know, we have a productive center for that top line in Minnesota, something that we've been desperately searching for basically all season long? Uh, it's the kind of thing that has given crazy people like myself thoughts about Marco Rossi potentially grabbing that spot at some point when obviously he has enough struggles just breaking into the NHL roster at all. Uh, so if you were given the choice, uh, Boldy and Velarde, uh, who do you think ends up uh, having more success in their positions, given that Velarde is on a line three, but a pretty good line three, definitely not a shutdown line three, that second line in, in LA takes care of that, uh, versus Boldy getting potentially even strength minutes with line one and also on that top power play. So for my personality, I would go with Fullardy, but the the thing is, is you kind of have to ask yourself is like if you want something consistent with a better shot and more likely to like give you something, I am a fan of Fullardy because I think he's going to be in that situation where he's already shown that he can play. He's not going to be the key piece, so he's not going to be you know pulling those Kepe four goals or doing those things. So he's going to be a nice, useful piece, and that's something that I kind like to have in like my bottom roster guys. Now the other side though of the coin is is that if Boldy somehow hits <laughs> and stays there, which honestly he could be off of it by the next game because that blender is just so hot. But as someone that was willing to play I think it's Sam Steele in different leagues just because of the chance to be playing with those two, we can all agree that Boldy is infinitely better. <laughs> Than Sam Steele just as a hockey player. So if I was willing to give him a shot and he can hit, that could be something like just dwarf Hartman, because I think we agree that he's better than Hartman, but like it could easily that he's just off into a random line with nobody before we're even done the sentence. So that's really where you want. If you need the hit, boldly, but if you're going for some sanity and just like some even keel, Lardy. Yeah, I love that you brought that up. So you and Kakapfall are in a position where you don't necessarily need the hit. You can be steady, and that's why I think Filardi appeals to you. And like, yes, he's gonna he's gonna be with Fiala almost certainly. He's gonna be on the top power play almost certainly. Maybe not instantly upon his return, but I bet pretty quick. Um, versus, yeah, Boldy, you know, could could disappear, right? But yeah, if he sticks, that could be really outstanding. I'm repeating my I'm repeating you here. But um, yeah, I think I'm in the position where, you know, I'm just trying to avoid being relegated too far. So I would I would look at Boldy, but uh, Filardi the guy I actually have on the roster. So <laughs> he's the one that I will stick with. We are going to head into just a quick little break here. You're listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back to Short Shifts. All right, well, we just finished talking about Boldy and uh, Velarde and some players in interesting positions. Here's another one that I thought was worth mentioning, and uh, he got the short shifts bump already just for being on a card in our Trello. Dylan Strom uh, was elevated to power play one uh, with Ovi out. I was wondering if there was any interest. He's centering a kind of line two and a half ish with uh, TJ Oshie and Joe Snively, uh, while he, you know, they're kind of shifting things around with with Ovi out. He has been sticking with Ovi generally, although he's been not very productive up until he got that tip in goal this game. Uh, do you have any interest in Dylan Strom on power play one? I was just about ready to kick him to the curb. Uh, but I did hold on for one more game and he got the uh, he got the goal. So that's nice. But. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm feeling kind of out on Strom uh, with his long period of, of not very much production. Yeah, especially with the fact is that like I'm not I wasn't the biggest fan of Strom. It was literally more that I wanted a piece of Ovi and that's why I'd have Strom. So even if he gets more power play time, what is that power play time <laughs> like without Ovi in it? Like, and don't forget, we don't have Carlson either. So like the two best players that you'd be wanting to be a part of with that 
uh, power play are not there. So, like, I feel like the extra deployment helps to maybe make it not an obvious drop, but, like, I feel like if he's not a drop right away, he's like that, like, one or two forward ready to go if you have, like, a injury replacement or someone spicy to pick up, maybe a Velarde. I'd be even tempted to replace him with. <laughs> yeah, I've got Velarde, Raymond, and DeBrusco potentially coming off uh, off IR, and that's the guy I've got my eye on to potentially be a drop, even over Anthony Sorelli, who doesn't have the same kind of exposure but has been much more exciting lately. But credit where it's due, seven shots for Strom uh, with about 40 seconds left in the third period. So uh, nice work there. Uh, unfortunately, Boone Jenner just potted one for my opponent and against your David Riddick. So, uh, just, <laughs> uh, an update on, on what's going on, uh, as I surf the, uh, as I surf the scores here. Uh, let's head on to, uh, a great question that we had from at PD Hat Tricks on Twitter. Uh, he said, all right, we have goalie stats, wins, save percent, saves, and shutouts. I have Shesterkin, Sorokin, Markstrom, and UPL. Grubauer, Vladar, Sogard, and Varlamov are available. Uh, please rank the available goalies and comment if who you would drop for top choices. Um, do you want to take a stab at this one before I say my piece? So, yeah. So, I think that the first thing that I'm going to open with is just to check is that I'm not much of a person that drafts high-end goalies or has them in um, trades or whatnot. But the fact that you have just Durkin and Sorokin, like... I'm not sure how many you start in a day or like how big your rosters are. I would actually be contemplating it, looking at maybe just like running those two or maybe only having like a third and then deciding to just use your extra roster space on forwards. But if we're talking about just like, hey, it's normal to have four people and whatnot, obviously I'm with just Sirkin, Sirokin, those we just know that are going to be there. And then I think everyone. And uh, Lewis, I, you probably know this well of just Markstrom. I'm just done with him. It's about like if you're getting starts, sure, but he's not getting starts. And when he gets the starts, you're not guaranteed. So I would just kick him to the can. So really, the dance for me is because I like my starts. It would be a coin flip between, I would say, Grubauer or UPL, just because I feel like they're going to more likely get starts and longer. And then you can make the argument to like go for Sogard if you just like want to just have a hot run in the short term. And honestly, if there's these guys on the uh, wire, you might be able to just like pick up Vladar after uh, Talbot comes back. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, besides kind of a rough outing against Calgary, uh, UPL has been uh, pretty solid. Uh, although overall, uh, his goals against and save percentage both took a, a hit from that seven goal against game. Uh, I, I'm of a mind uh, with you. I think Markstrom, I, I'm ready to be done. I, I on Twitter celebrated my Independence Day from Markstrom. He's not playing well and he's losing starts. So if you're going to carry a guy who's only getting half the games, I know they want him to to get his stuff back, right? He's signed through 26. But if I'm going to play a guy who's only getting half the games, give me Vartlamov, uh, you know, at a 917 save percentage with three quality starts in his last four, 61% quality starts on the season. Uh, or Grubauer, 60% quality start, six quality starts in the last seven, although that seventh was a really bad start. You mentioned, uh, Uka Pekalukinen, who, uh, you know, is, is someone who can get a win any given night with the offense that he's got. I feel like my strategy would be to grab Sogard for a short term run since he's pretty much guaranteed more starts. So that'll give you the volume until Talbot gets back. And then I think when Talbot gets back, look, if you want to grab one of the other guys on the list, I would rank them. Varlamov, uh, basically a coin flip between Grubauer and uh, uh, 6K, Uka Pekalukinen, uh, and then Vladar kind of last just because we haven't seen all we want to see out of Calgary. Uh, if you really want to secure a guy or just stream backups with good matches, you know, I, I don't love holding a, a roster spot uh, with someone who who isn't getting, you know, as many starts. And, you know, obviously I was uh, enduring a sunk cost with Markstrom for a long time. But now that I'm free, I'm not anxious to pick up uh, another guy. And I think, too, you're going to see more good matchups for backup goalies, uh, maybe not even on back-to-back -back nights. Just as the season goes on, those teams that are secure in their playoff position are going to want to give their elite goalies some rest. 
Uh, and I think that's an opportunity where you can, you know, uh, uh, grab a backup goalie with, with a great matchup, not even on a back to back, uh, where he's at, more at a risk to get blown up, uh, behind a tired team. So that's where I would go with things. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're in a similar spot there. Yeah, I agree. And then also, I think, uh, I always have the points league brain in me. Is that maybe I'm with you? Is that like, if you want to get a little bit of spicy, you might consider trying to trade UPL to someone that's in a different goalie situation that wants just like, doesn't care about the, um, the rate stats as much and just wants to wins. And then you could just have uh, Varlamov and then like, you would have most likely the save percent like locked up and like, it is something to consider. And honestly with uh, Sorokin, you probably have like such a good shot. I forget his percentage of shutouts that, you have the best goalie for a categories league with shutouts because he's just like set for that at anyone. But uh, either way, you got two that you're set that honestly you got like basically however you want to spice the dish at the end. You can probably not go wrong when you have those. <laughs> yeah, he's sort of uh, everything that you hoped you would be getting from Markstrom, I think, so far this season. All right, Shams, well, we have hit the end of our run here today. Uh, thank you, as always, for joining us. Uh, uh, just a blast to get to, to talk some puck, especially having taken off uh, Tuesday for some very valid reasons. Hopefully you enjoyed Elon's true short shift uh, that he put together for us with some great info on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, uh, like I said, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blast. Uh, thanks for everybody who joined us on the Twitch stream. Good to, uh, good to see you there in the chat. Uh, please make sure and give us a follow at short shifts KK. If you ask a great question like PD hat tricks did, uh, we'll answer it on the show. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, Brian and Elon, of course you can follow at keeping Carlson. I also recommend you follow at game day lines at game day goalies and at game day news NHL. And it's all organized. So nice at game day tweets.com. Uh, please visit that site and the other great sites we use to research our episodes at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, and Natural Stat Trick. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach. John Reed is our digital media producer. And until we see you next time, folks, play smart and keep your shifts short. <laughs>